So hi everybody, welcome to the uh, Theatre Zoutplein, uh, the Dutch Double Bass Festival, and this is one of our talking bass sessions where you get to put your questions to uh, one of the great uh, jazz bassists of our time, somebody who I'm a big fan of, I'm really excited to uh, well, dig into their story a little bit and learn more about them. So if anyone has any questions in the audience, please just, you know, jump in, put your hand up. It is quite hard for us to see, so you might need to make yourself known, possibly by moving across the side there, and we'll, you know, just kind of keep this open and feel free to jump in. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the 2021 Dutch Double Bass Festival, it's Ben Williams. Thank you. Ben. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, you've come a long way, you know. Have you enjoyed traveling again and getting out on the road? Yeah, yeah well, maybe not everything about it. Yeah. But, uh, I am definitely uh, happy to be um, just performing, playing anywhere, you know, definitely getting to travel. Um, you know, I'm just happy that everything is open enough to, to go overseas and um, kind of get back to somewhat, you know, somewhat of a normal life. It's such a nice experience, isn't it? I mean, how has the, uh, the last kind of 18 months been for you with the, one of the, I mean, musically, I, I mean, you've released a record. Um, I mean, maybe before we get to that, the, I also noticed you were doing some work with, uh, was it David Sanborn? Yes. Yeah, you played in one of his videos. I was checking out yeah. his videos thinking, this is cool. I was like, who's the guy on bass? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that because that was a really cool lo lockdown project. Yeah, so actually uh, I've been playing with, with Dave uh, for about, I want to say about four years now, okay. four or five years. I started playing with him around 2016, I want to say. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, David Sanborn, the great uh, iconic saxophonist, um, he started this separate band, uh, aside from his normal band where he does his, uh, his regular material. Um, and he wanted us to do like a more of an acoustic type of group, but, um, you know, still grooving and still funky, like, you know, like he like he like he likes to do it, um, and uh, so yeah, he called me. He called me up, and um, you know, so the the band is with myself, Billy Kilson, Wycliffe Gordon, and uh, Jeff Keezer. Oh wow! So yeah, pretty <laughs> yeah, not not too bad. Yeah, I loved it. It was really great to see that. Yeah, it was really cool. So Dave, uh, we we actually started doing this series called. Um, um, the Sanborn Sessions, yeah, and uh, we filmed the first number of episodes at his home, actually in uh, in Terrytown, New York, just just north just north of New York City, and um, so you know when the lockdown started, um, you know obviously we were all home, we couldn't um, congregate and and do the filming at his home, so um, you know, it had been just such a big hit, and people were really being receptive to. Uh, to this thing that we were doing. So basically the idea of the Sanborn Sessions is to have his band and uh, bring in a special guest, um, sort of reminiscent of the uh, of Night Music, you know, the show that he had back in the day. And um, so yeah, we, he would bring in all these, uh, just a very diverse group of special guests. Like, you know, we had uh, Michael McDonald come by, um, Bob James, Charlie Hunter, wow. um, Terrace Martin, um, you know, and just really, it just kind of speaks to uh, the type of musician that Dave is, um, Mr. Sanborn. He has a real presence, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so much energy in those videos. The, in a, yeah, he just gives off this vibe of, yeah, let's do yeah. this. Yeah, and he just had, he's such an, an open-minded musician and really loves uh, all styles of music. And uh, so, yeah, you know, um, since we couldn't physically be together, we decided to... Uh, continue to do it and just kind of put it together virtually. So everybody, um, you know, sent in their videos and we recorded our parts separately and just kind of put it together. And um, yeah, we did an episode with Sting. Yeah. Recently, yeah. That gets pretty, so pretty heavy. Was, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. You know, if you're gonna do a virtual gig, you know, why not do it with Sting? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Wow, I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, and then your uh, latest record, "I Am a Man," that was obviously has come out during uh, lockdown. So was that recorded prior to that? Or yeah. Is, tell so, us about that. Uh, yeah. So it actually came out right before uh, the pandemic kind of shut everything down. Right. Uh, it was released in February 2020. Oh wow! Like. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> but like a, exactly about a month before everything closed down, and. Um, 
Yeah, so um, I Am A Man was, uh, is my last, my last project. Uh, it feels like a new record because, you know, it feels like the world just kind of pressed pause for a year and a half or, or two years. So, um, you know, this touring now, it just, it, we're kind of just recently getting a chance to uh, perform this music publicly. And uh, I Am A Man is, um, is, is quite different from my other projects. Um, firstly, because I'm, I'm singing on the album, um, it's a... Uh, it's an entire vocal album, um, which is something new for me. You know, something I just started doing cool. uh, pretty recently, um, really? singing in public. So, um, and the the subject matter is um, it's sort of dealing with um, sort of inspired by civil rights, yes. um, the civil rights movement. Uh, I am a man was actually the mantra for um, a, a very well known and famous uh, strike that happened. Uh, the uh, the sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, went on strike in 1968 after two of their workers were killed on the job, and um, you know they weren't, you know at that that time, especially in society, you know um, uh, these black men were not protected by the the society that they lived and contributed to, um, so you know they decided to go on strike, and um, actually doc, Dr. Martin Luther King was. Um, was there in their support, and that's actually why he was in Memphis when he was assassinated. Um, but so the slogan for their strike was "I am a man," and you can find a lot of these uh, old, these old pictures of of the strike with all these men holding uh, this picket sign saying "I am a man." And um, you know, it was something about that that phrase and um, just the meaning of it that that really resonated with me and, and inspired me to sort of dig into it and and bring it to the into a look at it from a contemporary perspective and you know and what what did I have in common with these these men back in 1968 and you know how does that apply to the world that I live in um, so so basically the album is this sort of introspective look into the the mind and the soul of the contemporary black male. And this is, uh, tell us about the band. Who do we have in this? Is, uh, is Marcus Strickland on? Yeah, yes, yeah. Marcus Strickland. And he's on the road with you as well? Yes. Yeah, Incredible player. Yeah, and I also was checking out your uh, discography earlier. He's played on so many of your recordings. Yeah, yeah Marcus is, is on all the albums that I've, uh, I've recorded. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've just been fortunate to have one of the greatest young saxophonists of our generation. Yeah. Um, and we, yeah, we've done a lot of playing together over the years. Um, I've actually played on uh, most of his recent records as well. So it's a really cool uh, relationship. And with this um, uh, this record that you're, uh, I guess, touring at the moment, is, is is your show featuring? Is it pretty heavy for My Am a Man? Is it in terms of the material that you're presenting? And and if so, what's what's the balance of? I know double bass and bass guitar play a part in your life. How how's that featuring on the road at the moment? Um, yeah, currently we're doing a majority of music from the new record. Um, you know, it's, it's new music and, you know, part of that process after recording and putting out, you know, you want to play it and um, kind of, you know, try it out on the people and see, uh, just see how it feels in a live setting. And, um, you know, that's so important and it's, it's something that we just missed so much, you know, just that, that, that part of the whole album cycle where you you know you do the record and you put it out and people can listen to it at home but um, that experience of hearing music live and how it's interpreted live it's a it's a whole nother thing that yeah we, that there's no substitute for and how's how is uh how have you found the balance of uh playing the two instruments over your over your career is it something that you've always kind of kept up or is one been a bigger part of your life than the other um, so actually on the album, I'm, I'm playing almost a exclusively electric bass um, because just the, musically the way I was approaching the songs was um, sort of more coming out of the R&B, soul, um, sonically, and just the, the whole sound of it. Um, I think I'm playing upright on like, like for like 30 seconds at the end of the album. And sure. then there's like another track I'm playing upright. Um, 
But uh, for the live show, um, I'm kind of mixing it up. I like to, you know, sometimes I decide like right before we play the song, like, you know what, I think I'm gonna play this one up right tonight. And just, it just gives you a whole different, um, that's, that's the cool thing about being able to play those two instruments that, you know, I don't like to really um, marry myself to one or the other when I'm playing a song. You know, sometimes I, I'll pick up the upright for a song that I've, I'll typically play on electric and vice versa, just to um, kind of, you know, give me like a fresher perspective of the song. It's so interesting here, but you, I, uh, did, you, did you recently share a clip of you playing some bass guitar stuff on upright bass though? Was it some Jackson, Michael Jackson music? Oh yeah. It was a really cool medley. And it was man, thanks for checking out my social media. Man. Man, I, I'm, always, <laughs> I'm glad I'm, somebody's I'm, watching it. I'm, so. that bass, I'm that bass guy. <laughs> I said to you uh, just before we start, I'm that bass guy searching on YouTube for Ben Williams bass solo. It's oh, me, it's it. me yeah. there. Man. And, um, but yeah, that, was, it's, that just had such a great energy and a great feel. And, you know, and it's really cool hearing, as you say, presented on a different instrument and uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I started playing the upright and electric bass kind of around the same time. Okay. Um, so they've they've always kind of existed in in my in my life musically, and you know, I grew up listening to mostly, you know, kind of R and B, soul, hip hop, uh, funk music. Uh, you know, from the stuff that my mom was listening to in the house. You know, a lot of Motown. Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Marvin Gaye, James Brown, that kind of stuff, which is, you know, most of that music is has electric bass in it. So um, my first, the, the first sound of a bass, I, you know, my, my first reference of a bass sound was like James Jamerson, yeah. basically. Um, so, you know, even when I started playing the upright, um, I was just, that was my first point of reference in terms of like what it was to what it meant to play bass. So um, I didn't think of it as, you know, oh, you're supposed to play this style of music on this instrument. You're supposed to play this style of music on this instrument. I'm like, the bass is a bass. So just learn how to play it. And then, you know, if you know how to play both instruments, you should just be able to play whatever you want to play on either instrument. That's so that was just kind of my approach. I love it. I, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it sounds great. And I'll provide a link underneath this video for everyone to go. And obviously, ch go check out Ben's uh, um, uh, Instagram channel because it's right on there and it's, it gives you a bit of inspiration for the day. Um, just taking it uh, back further to when you were graduating or coming onto the scene uh, back in, I think it was 2009, you won the Monk uh, Prize. Yes. And what's really exciting about this is that the panel of uh, the panel that judged the jazz bass competition, uh, this really prestigious um, prize that you won, included basically a who's who of the jazz world. And I've seen a photo of the panel sat in the theatre and not realised why they were together. And it was only on realising that you won this and what it must have been for that occasion, because it included yes. The great Bob Hurst, the yeah. wonderful, I believe Charlie Hayden, mm -hmm. and there's John Patitucci and a Mr. Carter. Yes. Sir Ron Carter is there, yes. and and who uh, else? It's Christian McBride. Christian McBride. Um, there's, 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 it's just everybody, you know. Yeah, it was terrifying. I bet it was. How did you, how did you <laughs> feel, kind terrifying. of playing for them? Um, I try to forget that they were all sitting right there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, don't, you know, because they, you know. Well, you don't know who's sitting in the audience and like where they're sitting in the audience when you yeah. come out on stage. You just, you know, you just kind of playing, you know, sitting backstage and warming up and just trying to get yourself together mentally. And, um, you know, the last thing I wanted to happen is to, to walk out on the stage, you know, it's at the Kennedy Center, it's a big hall, and see, you know, all of my heroes just sitting right next to each other in a row. Yeah. Like, you know, waiting for me to, like, play okay, now. all right, uh, what, what you got? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, it's quite terrifying to even think about that, you know, literally all my, you know, some of my biggest bass influence and all my heroes, uh, you know, sitting all there right, right in front of me. Um, it must have been really yeah. moving to be, you know, validated in that yeah. way. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's your record collection, you know? Yeah, <laughs> saying, absolutely. You know, and to just kind of get that, 
that stamp of approval from from your heroes, you know, not just one of them, but a whole panel of them. Uh, it just that that was the that's the the prize for me. Yeah. You know. And another photo that I've seen of you, which is I, I love Ben. I remember I shared this on Instagram when I when I saw it. Is there's this great image of you as a very young man and Ron Carter. Yeah. And can you tell us about that and how old you are? Yeah, I think I was like 12. Yeah, and you're also um, really sharply dressed. Like Mr. Yeah. Carter, he's always <laughs> impeccably dressed. I did not dress myself. But there's, in, that's yeah, a good I picture. Like a suit, I was like, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, it's, <laughs> you know, it's like seeing these people together. You know, for me, I was really excited. But what yeah. happened in that situation? Um, I believe that that photo was from a workshop that I was doing with the, the Monk Institute. Oh. Uh, now the Hancock Institute. And, um, you know, they, they did a lot of work with uh, youth in the Washington DC area, uh, which is my hometown. And um, yeah, so it was like a, a workshop. I, I probably didn't even know who Ron Carter really was. You know, at that age, I guess. At that yeah. age, you know, he was just this big, tall, like kind of scary man. <laughs> um, and I remember he told me to not tap my foot when I played. Oh, okay. That's one thing I remember, you know. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. This, that, that picture just kind of continued to float around and um, I don't it's just it very, recently. yeah, like it, it seems like every couple of years it just kind of pops up again. But I love the way this line with the jazz tradition, you know, that you can yeah. see it being drawn, drawn through and I, I love these connections between players. Yeah. yeah it's an exciting thing. Yeah. And, and what about, um, you know, looking out into the, you know, into the audience and people watching at home on video, what advice would you have for uh, younger students who are trying to find their way in the jazz world? You know, is there any kind of particular message that you'd like to share? I mean, I think the, you know, one I would say, you know, try to find um, some type of teacher or mentor situation, um, you know, wh wherever you are. You know, I know things are a lot, the world is a lot different now than it was when I was when I first started. Um, so, you know, it's easy, it's much easier to like kind of reach out to people and communicate mm -hmm. with folks. But, um, you know, there's, you know, I always say the greatest teacher is experience, you know, so just try to get as much playing experience as you possibly can. So, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot that you can study on your own. Um, and, you know, this music is, there's so much information. It's you know, it, it literally, it's a lifetime of, of learning, and you know, you kind of always, you know, we use the word student when we're kind of referring to younger people starting off, but mm. in reality, we're we kind of never stop being a student. You know, I feel like as much I feel like I'm learning just as much now as I did when I was 12, uh, every day. So. You know, I, I would say just always keep that spirit. Just always stay curious, um, keep an open mind, and uh, try to keep your mind, especially open to things that you're not as familiar with, and maybe stuff that you don't really, you're not into. Um, just check it out. It's funny how sometimes it's that combination of timing in your life, like you might not quite be ready for a love supreme, but you yeah. might, you know, be ready for something else, and then at the right moment, it's there for you, and you can draw on that. And yeah. And you know, if you just you just kind of hang out enough, you'll you'll hear, um, you know, I always say like if you hear something more than once, if you hear a name or you hear a record more than once, you should probably go check it out. There's probably a reason why, you know, there's certain names that just continue to float yeah. around that you you'll just keep, you know, you'll just hear the word, you'll hear more than one person mention Ray Brown, and Paul Chambers. And Ron Carter, and, it, and it's for a reason, you know. So that's kind of your your usually your biggest clue to go check out something. Yeah. So. Um, and I love the trail yeah. between you know records of finding, you know, uh, yeah, just just moving between the artists and thinking, oh, okay, who's playing on kind of blue and yeah, yeah, know, like oh, okay, we, you know, right. who's playing on this record and yeah, like, Winton Kelly's on piano here and then. Whatever, Paul Chambers is here, and then I check out his solo record, and, you know. And yeah, really connecting the dots, you know, because, I mean, none of this, no music exists in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, not just listen to the records, but check out who's on it, you know, not just the bass player, but who the whole band I is. I miss that, you know, with the, um, 
uh, di listening to music dig digitally, it's, it's, it is the album covers, but for me, it's the personnel that I find it hard to find, and I, I'm, yeah. you know, I want to know, and you know, who's on who's on bass on this particular recording, and I want to chase that up. And um, so, listen, this is the talking bass session. So we are supposed to be opening this up to the room. I'm hogging all the uh, the time here with Ben. Who has a question? Is somebody going to fire? Uh, of judges that were at the mum contest, which one did you most identify with? I mean, which one did you maybe study more or listen to more than others? Which one was the most hero for you? Um, wow, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, between Christian McBride and, and Bob Hurst, Dave Holland, Charlie Hayden, Ron Carter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I learned a lot from all of those, all of those men. And, um, you know, they all have very different styles. So um, I can't say that I even really learned more from one than the other. I mean, I would say if I had to, you know, if you put a gun to my head and like tell me who was my biggest influence on, my, on that panel, I would probably say Ron Carter, um, just overall, um, you know, just his entire legacy and his catalog of, uh, of work is humongous you know i believe he's like one of or if, if not the most recorded bass players in music history i think it's ronald milt hunton i guess are the two that would be vying yeah. up there with yeah so um yeah definitely ron um is, is, has been a huge and continues to be a huge influence on my playing yeah it's a great question has anyone got any follow-up questions is, is a gentleman oh sorry yeah, please. Uh, what would be the, uh, the first word that comes to your head when you talk about each panelist? Uh, like, what did you get from each of them? Because, the, like you said, they all had something to offer in different ways, maybe. Um, I would say the first thing is sound. Mm -hmm. You know, they all have uh, a very unique sound that's that to me is their identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I say the first thing that people hear when you play an instrument is your sound. Um, it's like, it's the tone of your voice. And you know, it's like, it's as personal as your speaking voice. You know, if your best friend calls you on the phone, you don't need to see that it's, even if you don't look at the caller ID, you hear their voice, you know exactly who it is. Um, and I think all of those, um, all of those players, their, their sound is, to me, it's instantly recognizable. Um, and they could probably, if you if you brought a bass in here and they all played that same bass, they would they would all sound like them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, I would say probably the first thing and most importantly for me is that they all have a uh, their own sound of the instrument. That's really yeah, it's really cool. And how about yourself, sir, in the middle there? Yeah, I um, and you said you started singing not so long ago in public. Um, I really like singing bass players. Um, can you talk a bit about this process for you? How is this singing and bass playing at the same time? Yeah, um, so this actually started um, around 2018. Um, I was touring with a, uh, a great vocalist that I, I still work with. I'm actually doing something with him tomorrow, uh, Jose James. Uh, we were doing this tour of uh, a project that he did recently. And we uh, was we're doing all Bill Withers music. And uh, while we were on the road, you know, just kind of hanging out like most musicians do, um, I had been working on some demos for this, uh, for the new project. And, um, you know, because of like the subject matter and kind of what I was going for, I already knew there was gonna be quite a lot of vocal material. You know, I was sort of more taking, taking more of a, a songwriting approach to this particular project. Um, but the, originally the plan was to have other singers sing these songs. I wasn't planning to really do it myself. And um, so Jose heard the demos, you know, I was just kind of playing it for him. I was like, you know, check out some of this new stuff I'm working on. He's like, oh man, it sounds great. He's like, who's that singing, by the way? I said, oh, that's me. He's like, oh man, you, you sound good, man. You should, just, you should just do it yourself. I was like, uh, that's not really the plan, but... I'll think about it. Um, and so I did think about it. And, um, you know, we, you know, like I usually do, I, I like to play the music in public, just kind of work out the, the kinks and just kind of see how everything feels. 
And uh, I just started singing on gigs in, in, the, in public. And uh, I remember having a show at the Blue Note and I had written a, a, a new song. So obviously there wasn't enough time to teach it to a singer, um, you know, because you can't really like just give them charts and, you know, you usually have to uh, sort of like make a, a demo for them so they can hear it and have some time to sit with it. So this is literally like the day of the show, the morning of the show at the Blue Note in New York. And I was like, but I want, I want to do this song. And the only way we're going to do it is if I sing it myself. So I just decided like very haphazardly, you know, I think I'm just going to sing. Yeah. And it just, it just started from there, um, you know, just kind of getting more comfortable with it. You know, obviously the challenge of playing and singing is a whole nother conversation in itself. Um, you know, this, it, which I, I continue to uh, and just enjoy the challenge of actually, you know, obviously bass playing is something I've been doing my, almost my entire life and sort of adding this new element of, on, on top of it, it's, it almost feels like I'm like learning music all over again. Cause I have to, you know, it's like doing this thing, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, wow, like, you know, doing two, like two other things. So it's, um, you know, it's like my, uh, my RAM is, <laughs> it feels like it's maxed out most of the time. Cause you know, and I have to worry about this, you know, I have to worry about singing and make sure I'm singing in tune. And, you know, I, I have to, there's so much I have to deal with now, you know, when I'm doing both things. And it's, it's pretty exhilarating. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Ben, maybe if we could just finish off with a couple of quick fire questions, because these are the ones that people always ask us. Tell us about the equipment that you're using at the moment, because I know that this is, that's the thing. People are like, oh, is he spiral cord I was bikes? waiting for the bass nerd yeah, stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I know that the thing is, I was actually going to leave it, but I knew that I'd get people saying it, but it's like, God, you didn't ask him, you know, you've got to ask him. So let us know, what, what's, um, yeah, like what's your bass look like? What's your string setup? Just a brief kind of rundown on that. Okay, yeah, yeah? absolutely. Um, my favorite part. I know it's, <laughs> we're at a bass festival. Right? We gotta, we gotta get to the nerdy stuff. Um, so my bass, my primary upright is an old German bass. That's kind of all I know about it. Um, it's it's about seventy years old. Cool. Um, the strings I'm using is a, a Diodario. I'm a Diodario art, artist. Cool. So I'm using the Zyx strings, um, which are really great. They sound really good as soon as you put them on and then like kind of give them a couple of months they just they really sit very well um i'm using a the david gauge not the realist but the um sound clip thing the not the clip the <laughs> what is it what's the new one called that kind of goes under the adjuster oh, lifeline lifeline lifeline, yeah. lifeline. um using lifeline pickup um and i run through a um so a lot of this music you'll hear tonight that I'm doing, it's pretty, it's pretty heavy. You know, it's a lot of sound, so I have to kind of get um, a lot of volume. There's a lot of volume on stage, like a little more than most like acoustic jazz settings. So, um, you know, the the problem with acoustic bass most of the time that the this, the battle that we're having is amplifying it. You know, sort of preserving the the quality of the instrument, the quality of the sound while uh, boosting the volume. Mm. So, uh, you know, I've just been on this journey for years and years. Um, so I have this, I use a Tube DI. Uh, it's a Con, it's made by this company called Con Audio. And um, it's like a vacuum tube DI, so I primarily run that through the house. Um, and it kind of just helps to uh, sort of give some keep the life in, into, the, into the DI signal and kind of keep it nice and warm. Um, and it's easier for a sound man to deal with because it's not an open mic, mm. so they can, they do not worry about bleeding from the drums and all this other sound. Um, a lot of times I'll just, I'll do maybe just that and add the mic, you know, it depends on how the stage is set up. Uh, so my amp, I usually use a, an Aguilar DB751 head um, and a, 
Uh, I like the GS410 cab. Yeah. It's actually discontinued, but that was my favorite one. All my favorite stuff usually gets discontinued. They're heavy, um, they're heavy, like, that's heavy yeah. gear. You get your, you know, it's get the your old, Yeah, the old school one. So I like it. Usually I'm, I'm not, I don't like pick it up. I just think <laughs> it was too heavy. Um, so yeah, 410 cab, because um, like I said, you know, kind of require a little more volume yeah. and a little more low end on stage. So uh, I need that a little extra. Yeah, you know, well, um, thanks so much for getting into all the details and yeah, giving us uh, a look behind uh, the, the curtain with the gear. So just to finish off, where can people go to learn more about you? Where can we follow you online? Uh, do you have a website, social media? Yeah, uh, my website is benwilliamsmusic.net. Uh, my Instagram is benwmsonbass. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm on Facebook as well, just under my name. Cool. Um, yeah, well, so, have you know, a great show tonight, thank you, thank you know, you. and thank you so much for coming and joining us and thanks to the audience and please, you know, join me in thanking one last time the great Ben Williams. Ben, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.